Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. No longer known as Coates, now it's CES. Matthias came up with it. I think it's a good idea. So if you're someone that always referred to us as Coates, uh, let's, let's train ourselves to call ourselves CES or Church of the Eternally Secure. All right, well, welcome everybody. Uh, if you are watching this uh, live and you're here with us for the ver very first time, uh, I'm happy uh, you're here. I want to welcome you. I hope that you enjoy this Bible study tonight. Maybe you'll also want to join us for our Sunday church service, uh, 5 p.m. Eastern, and our fellowship Friday night. That's also 9.30 p.m. Eastern time. So you're invited to join all these live programs. Uh, and uh, for those uh, regular participants, uh, you are what we call the congregation. So welcome back. All right. Uh, all right, well, let's begin. But we've got with me, of course, on the Wednesday night Bible study, Brother Cripps and Sister Renee. So Sister Renee, say hi to everybody. And maybe somebody doesn't know what your channel does. T tell them, please. Hey, guys, it's Renee Rowland. Um, my affectionate term of endearment is the untwisted sister because my channel contends for the faith once delivered unto the saints and I untwist verses people use twisting them up to make you think that you must do something that salvation is contingent upon something you do to get maintain or keep or even prove salvation uh, when it's all Christ focused instead of man focused. So that's what my channel does, and it's the channel of the same name, Roland, R-O-L-A-N-D, Renee. Good to see you guys. All right. Thank you, sister. And we've got Brother Cripps here also. Tell him about talk, um, True Story Live, please. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Luke. Uh, my name is Jason Cripps. I'm part of a channel called True Story Live, and uh, we do broadcast on Sunday night at 9 p.m., and occasionally on Tuesday or Thursday, we uh, sometimes do uh, testimonies. So um, if you haven't been over to the channel, definitely uh, take a look. And what we do is uh, we have a panel uh, d a panel discussion and we have uh, a person uh, with us that uh, claims to be a non-believer. Uh, so he comes up with questions for other believers to answer. And then so we discuss the questions and the answers and uh, we welcome everyone uh, to come and listen. Um, we don't all have to have the same beliefs, but we're wanting to have uh, open, authentic discussions uh, without division. And we've proved over, I don't know how many episodes we've done, but we've proved that that can happen. Um, so uh, the other shows that I'm on this show on Wednesday, which is to my delight, and also uh, Monday night on Talk of Doctrine with uh, uh, Monday's milk and now the new feature Monday's meat once every quarter um, hello to the chat and it's a pleasure to be here and I can't wait for the, the study thanks all right thank you thank you brother Cripps all right before we get started just a message to the moderators in the chat room and uh, everybody else there uh, uh, I'd like everybody to keep in mind that this even though this is live on the internet uh, this is actually a church Wednesday night Bible study. So imagine if you are in a local congregation uh, in a building and they're doing a Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, that's the same mindset I hope you bring into the chat room. You're in a Bible study, so participate, uh, listen. Um, if you are in a Bible study in the church, you'd raise your hand and if you have a question. But here, if you're in the chat room, you have a question, just type it out to us, put it in all caps. If you have questions or if you have a comment and you want a response from us, put it in all caps and we'll uh, try to respond to your questions and your comments. Uh, however, uh, a Bible study in a church is, is not a place where uh, outsiders come in to come in and stir up trouble and, and, and uh, challenge our basic uh, doctrines. So um, oh, that's not going to be allowed. If, if, you, if that happens, moderators will deal with it. Okay, we are in... 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, uh, we did the first 10 verses last Wednesday, so we'll begin with verse 11, except I'll read verse 10 to, uh, so that we have uh, the... Brother Luke, uh, verse yeah. 
11, 12, and 13 are kind of all a continuance of the same point. Is it possible to just put them together? Yeah, I'll start with verse okay. 10, though, okay? Okay. 10, I'll read 10 through 13 then. Okay. Uh, uh, we're all at KJV first this year, so we'll read the KJV, uh, but we also like to look at the Amplified and uh, the um, NABRE uh, footnotes. Uh, okay, starting with verse 10. We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place and labor working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we suffer it, being defamed, it, we in retreat, we are made as the filth of the world and are the off scouring of all things unto this day. All right, Sister Renee. Hold on. Yes, just give him a chew thing. Sorry, we're having puppy crisis here. Uh, puppy doesn't Yay, puppy, yeah. puppy. You puppy. never know what to chew on and what, and yelling at him doesn't help. So uh, I wanted to remind that this is a reference uh, what we went over last week of how those guys had thought they had arrived. You know, the, the guys in the church thought they had gotten there. And so Paul kind of in a sarcastic way uh, says, we're fools for Christ's sake, but you're wise in Christ. We are weak, but you're strong. You're on, we are, ye are honorable, but we are despised. Um, I think this is just uh, uh, the same reference uh, to him uh, stating two things. One, that it, it's that the greatest, it's okay to be loose, uh, because then you're the greatest. But also, if you think you've arrived, then you need to humble yourself and realize that you have not. And I, I think that he's um, saying all of that here. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Brother Cripps, I'll read it in the Amplified for you. It's uh, starting 10 through 13. In the Amplified, it goes, We are regarded as fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are highly esteemed, but we are dishonored. To this present hour, we are both hungry and thirsty. We are continually poorly dressed, and we are roughly treated and wander homeless. We work for our living, working hard with our own hands. When we are reviled and verbally abused, we bless. When we are persecuted, we take it patiently and endure. When we are slandered, we try to be conciliatory and answer softly. We have become like the scum of the world, the dregs of all things, mm. even until now. Mm. Wow, there's a lot there. Uh, and this is the way it's going to be headed for again toward the end, I believe. I believe that the uh, situation that Paul and all the uh, believers at that time were going through, uh, he lays it out here pretty, pretty clearly. Um, we're fools for Christ, and here's all the things that happened, you know. Um, uh, we're hungry, we're thirsty, we're, uh, we're poorly dressed, uh, we're treated roughly, we wander without a home, uh, we work for a living, we work hard with our hands, we're reviled and verbally abused. But the, um, the reaction is we bless. When we're persecuted, we take it patiently and endure. When we're slandered, uh, we answer softly. Conciliatory is a great word in the Amplified. I love that uh, description. Um, and we've become like scum of the world, the dregs of all things, even until now. Um, we don't experience that here. I mean, like I've said on other other broadcasts, we yeah, there's some persecution here in America, but it's it's based on uh, people not liking us to say Merry Christmas. They want to say Happy Holidays instead, or 
um, it, it, you know, it's having a manger scene across the street from a school, a nativity scene, um, not being able to pray at the uh, high school uh, football games, things like that. Uh, some persecution for sure, but not to the extent that they were going through at this period of time. Uh, but the reaction that Paul's talking about here is the reaction we should have whenever there's persecution. And I think it's hard in the West, at least in America, I think it's hard for people to react like that. When people, even even uh, people that call themselves Christians, um, when someone gets up in your face and attacks you for your faith or for any other reason, it seems like uh, a lot of times we act the same way the world does. Um, I don't see uh, too many people when someone gets in their face or steals their parking place or uh, jumps in front of you at the line at the grocery store, uh, just taking it. Um, you know, I, I, I guess I don't know each person individually and know whether they uh, claim to be a, a Christian or not, but um, I know for me in the past, um, I wouldn't put up with anyone jumping in my face. I just wouldn't. Um, I've, I, thank God he's softened my heart since then and changed it from uh, stone to, uh, to flesh. Uh, now, uh, I'm very, very much aware of the way I react in any situation. And I try to take it. And he helps me with that. Thank God the Holy Spirit helps me with that. Um, but yeah, this is, he's just, he's just explaining the situation that they were in at that time. There was a lot of persecution and we don't have that yet here, but there are other countries that are, are going through some of these uh, similar things and even being killed. And um, I believe it's going to get worse and worse and worse until uh, if we survive, uh, we'll be enduring the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um He's contrasting uh, the congregation in Corinth. And uh, by the way, uh, if, you, um, if you're just in this Bible study tonight for the first time, you don't have the context of the previous chapters and the introduction to the, the book of First Corinthians, uh, it would be very helpful to you if you went and watched this from the beginning. But um, Paul established this church in Corinth. About a year and a half later, he's in Ephesus, and he gets a letter from uh, the leaders of, of Corinth. I th if I remember right, it was F uh, Priscilla, Priscilla and Aquila, and, and it's saying that there's all these problems going on, and Paul writes this letter to address five problems in that congregation. And so that's the that's kind of the gr groundwork for this book. But when he says, uh, comparing this congregation, who's he comparing it to when he says we? Well, we sh should have backed up really to verse nine because verse nine says, uh, for I think that God hath set forth us the apostles last, as it were appointed to, to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. And then it goes into the next verses that we uh, we just read today. So uh, all of this is not about just the church as a whole. Uh, it's specifically about the apostles, the leaders, the, the apostles, uh, and also probably the, the closest co-workers of the apostles. I'm assuming that they're probably included in this. Uh, this is all the things that they suffer for their faith and their 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 ministry works um it makes me think and i should make us all think have have you ever suffered for your faith uh have all these things he's talking about here um uh, well first of all he says uh you're wise but uh we're just fools now of course we established last time that he's using the technique of, of sarcasm to, to make a point. He doesn't really believe that he and his close co-workers are fools. Uh, and he doesn't really believe that the Corinthian congregation is wise. He's using sarcasm. Yeah. Uh, and then he's, he's, he's saying, 
that because he said, well, you guys have all this stuff going for you. And you think you really got it together. I mean, you, you're, you're, you've got education, you've got philosophy, you've got position in life, you've got wealth, all these things going for you. But we apostles, uh, we're just fools and we're homeless and you know, tattered clothes and don't know where our next meal is coming from. And we're working with our own hands to try to get, get make ends meet. And so that's the contrast between the congregation in Corinth and Paul and the, his co-workers and the apostles as a whole. Um, now, I reflect and say, how much have I ever suffered for my faith? Um, I, if everybody's heard me give my, uh, my testimony through my interview, Brother Mark um, cased over interviewed me and I gave an account of my whole life. And I told about when I first got saved, I, uh, I went through a period of, of some kind of, uh, I don't want to say persecution, but I actually was not even accept, accepted in my own home. I had to leave my own home because my wife thought I lost my mind. And then as I, uh, that lasted only a few months, uh, but um, we, uh, uh, and then as my as my faith grew and my knowledge and studies grew, eventually I decided to go out and do a public ministry work. And that's when I really felt some of these things. I had the experience as I'm out in the world preaching the gospel on the streets, that's when I saw this kind of behavior. Uh, and when I first started public uh, preaching, uh, I, I designed and ordered some t-shirts that, that, that said that only Jesus can save you. Nice. And, and I started wearing those shirts, not just when I was out preaching, but just when I would go out and around. And, and I, I also got that same shirt and gave it to my nephew, Ken, who lives in Washington. Uh, he's a believer too. And, and he started wearing that around. And something very interesting uh, we both realized is that when you wear the name Jesus boldly on your chest, I'm not talking about the little kind of Christian church that has little small letters and people have to come up and read a lot and try to figure out what that's all about. I'm talking about just trust Jesus real big on your shirt. You can't be missed. When you do something like that and people see it, they react to it. And uh, Ken told me, he says, when I first put that shirt on and I went was flying back to Washington, I, I noticed in the airport, I was very self-conscious and everybody was looking at me. And I noticed that um, it, 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 a normal reaction, maybe where I might do something uh, without thinking in, in the flesh, because I had that shirt on, it made me think, twice and I, it kind of slowed down all my reactions because I knew that I had publicly had Jesus's name on me and I did not want to react in a way that was ugly, maybe the way we would normally. But when we have the name Jesus on us like that, then it, it tempers us. And uh, I, I noticed that too, that, that actually helped to change my behavior. What we want though is eventually we don't want to have to wear a shirt with a big Jesus on it to remind us, let's wear, I'm, I'm an ambassador for Christ. I want to make sure I don't flip someone off or lose my patience or get angry with someone or like, like that. I'm representing Jesus. And so um, whether I'm wearing that shirt or not, and gradually the Holy Spirit transformed my mind, renewed my mind, and, and I didn't need the shirt to, to have that kind of an effect. Awesome. Uh, I did have this kind of response. When you go out and preach the gospel, these are the kinds of things you're going to deal with where you're going to be despised by people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, now, if you want to talk more about any one of these particular I, I do, real quick. Go ahead. I just wanted, you brought up the past. Um, uh, I wanted to remind them that they were saying, hey, I'm, I'm of Apollos. I'm of Paul. And he's saying, okay, you're going to lift these people up, even though we're one in Christ. We can't, we can't be divided. But you want to see us all lifted up this is the truth of how the world sees us and this is what we endure yeah. as apostles this is all the things that you know god's kingdom works differently than the world's kingdom does they might see somebody that's a loser they're going to see somebody uh, who wants that no money roaming around always you know going to jail and getting beaten but 
he realizes that there's a greater reward in heaven, but it's not going to be seen by the world as anything good. And um, I, I also agree with what you were saying, Jason, but it's interesting that you'll never see word of faith preachers using verses like this. Not at all. These were the apostles. Yeah. They didn't have, you know, fancy homes and all this stuff. I mean, Jesus himself said he had nowhere to lay his head. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, his kingdom is not of this world and it works differently than the world's kingdom does. Yeah. And I, I think his reminding them there is that sarcasm going on as, as we were talking about, you know, you think you've arrived, you know, if any man thinks he's wise, let him become a fool. And, um, but, uh, here he, he's reminding them you're lifting us up, you know, Apollos and Paul and Peter, but we in this world, at least, seem to be nothing nothing we're nothing that the world would consider great they, they'd call us fools but we're fools for christ's sakes and like jason said reminding us to react differently than the world would react but i, I really think this is a continuation of him reminding them you know you think you, you think you got it oh you're living like a king but we're just this you know, so um, I think that's a the major point he's bringing up. But I also wanted to remind us that word of faith preachers will never use this kind of stuff ever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like Brother Luke. I just want to add. I like what you uh, you're describing there as you having worn the T-shirt at one point, but you described how the Spirit changed your mind. He transformed your mind, and you said. And I believe this is a direct quote. You said you no longer needed the T-shirt. You know, you're doing that internally because of the change that he does in you. It's not, it's not by something you wear. It's not by something you present yourself as. It's done internally. And then the change is the shirt. The change that he makes in you is the shirt. It's the bumper sticker. It's the sign. It's the light. It's the salt. It's all of that. So I, um, that was edifying to me. Thank you, brother. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, obviously, uh, over the years, uh, I've come on here with a lot of different shirts, sure. with Christian shirts and slogans. Some of them are commercially bought, that have a message that's small print, and then some of them are big bull print that we made and designed specifically for the street preaching so that uh, people can read it uh, from a distance. And uh, I will say, I remember, oh so well, when I first started wearing those and how self-conscious I was, uh, and because everybody does look at them, mm -hmm. and everybody forms an opinion of you immediately, whether they say something or not. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I, I think I would encourage everybody to do that. Uh, if you could get a t-shirt made, um, you could go to sporting goods stores where they make clothing for sports teams or something and they they uh, that, I think that's where I had them made originally and and tell them what you want but the key is you want the name Jesus really big and bold so that uh, it really stands out and they can see it from a distance now if you do start wearing Jesus on your shirt on your on your chest it's even better on your chest than on your back because on your back you don't, you don't see people have their reaction to it but on your front, you see their face as they're approaching you, and you, you see their reaction on their face. If you do that, I'd like for you to let me know how that experience goes for you. Um, and uh, I think you'll find out that it is a way of helping you always be aware that Jesus is there with you all the time, and that uh, eventually, I mean, plus, it's a, it's a great opportunity be, to, because sometimes people will stop you and ask about the shirt, and it gives you a chance to uh, tell them the gospel. Amen. All right, now, we do have some footnotes here I want to look at on verses 9 through 13 in the NABRE, New American Bible Revised Edition. So the footnote uh, says, a rhetorically effective catalog of the circumstances of apostolic existence in the course of which Paul ironically contrasts his own sufferings with the Corinthians illusion 
that they have passed beyond the folly of the passion and have already reached the condition of glory. There's more, but I'll let me back up to where it says a rhetorically effective catalog. With rhetorically, of course, it's the root word is rhetoric. And I, I think it's very important if you're gonna understand the Apostle Paul, you have to understand that he is probably the most educated person you'll find in the Bible as far as all the, anybody who wrote a book in the Bible, I don't think anybody could match or, or, or surpass Paul's education. And, and uh, uh, he, he was very formally educated. Uh, he was a scholar and, and, and he uh, knew about not only Judaism and the law, but he knew about all kinds of philosophy. Uh, and, and so he, and he used rhetorical techniques. One of the techniques we talked about at the beginning of the book of Romans in that introduction that we I clearly I see Paul using it in the first few chapters of Romans it's called pro sopapia uh, I have a play this titled was Paul a diatribalist pro sopapia I hope you watch that it's only probably about three or four videos that are probably probably no more than 45 minutes total but uh, if you understand the rhetorical techniques that Paul uses in his writings, uh, it gives you a total different understanding of a lot of the things he's saying because many times Paul's writing is not even his own position. It's the position of the false teachers, the, his adversaries. Yep. So he sometimes will write down the position of the opponent and, and the person who's making charges against Paul and it's the same kind of charges made against Renee and me and Cripps and Matthias and all of us who are preaching the gospel that Paul preached. Uh, so uh, uh, you need to understand that. And and right here is saying this is a rhetoric rhetoric, and, and it's uh, in this case I think it's it's uh, sarcasm is, is the rhetorical technique he's using. Um, and then it says. His language echoes that of the Beatitudes and woes, which assert a future reversal of present conditions. Mm. Um, let me let me get uh, your feedback on that. Uh, I think what the, uh, the this is saying uh, in the footnote or this commentary is that um, uh, there's a reversal of. Um, um, in the Beatitudes and as, as, in, as end times play out. And we talked about how things are going to revert back to this, this scenario. It says, yeah. their present sufferings to this very hour place the apostles in the class of those to whom the Beatitudes promise future relief. Whereas the Corinthians image of themselves as already filled, rich and ruling, mm -hmm. as wise, strong and honored, place them paradoxically in the position of those whom the woes threaten with future undoing. Yeah. They have lost sight of the fact that the reversal is predicted for the future. Uh, Cripps or Renee, do you want to respond to that, that position that they are putting in the footnote here? Uh, I'll respond if Renee doesn't want to go first. No, go ahead. Um, yeah, this is kind of what I mentioned a little bit about the kind of thing that um, we're going to face in the future. So it's uh, obviously I'm delighted that it <laughs> that it went here. Uh, so this is what we're headed for, and I, I agree with what you're the way you're um, you're phrasing it, brother Luke. So the, this is this is saying the juxtaposition of the two uh, groups of people. Uh, and, and Paul's laying that out there, you, you know, comparing the two different things to each other. And then um, right now we're doing okay, but we're, you know, here in America, but eventually as the end times come, um, we're gonna be despised because we're not going along with the system that's gonna be set up. The B system is gonna, gonna demand um, more than loyalty. It's gonna demand worship and uh, no believer in, in their right, uh, the right position with Christ is going to uh, go along with that. They're going to hold up the works in many ways, and, and we're going to be a blight on society, I believe. Um, and then so they were experiencing some of that. 
uh, back then, not not all of them, obviously. Otherwise, Paul wouldn't have to address it. And um, wow, this is probably some of the best footnotes I've heard from this uh, version thus far. It's right on time. Yeah, I just wanted to add to something Jason said. You know, a, a lot of people claim to be Christian because they went to Jesus to have their problems cleared up and to get better financial situation and all this stuff, but never just because they know they're a sinner that's lost that needs a savior. It's always what to fix and get the things of this world. Yeah. And that's what's being preached right now. Yeah. Now when the time comes for anybody that claims Christ, they're, they're gonna not be able to work or buy and sell or feed their kids or get medical care and even maybe put in prison how many are going to be there? Like, how many are actually going to be? They're fair weather Christians, I, I say. And a lot of people uh, have us ask, well, I would hope that I would be able. Okay, nobody is ever going to be able to. You can see where Peter failed. He had all in his heart wanted to stand up and even die for Jesus. But without the power of the Holy Spirit, he was helpless because the Spirit's willing and the flesh is weak. Right. So you don't have the Holy Spirit. It's just an off note. I'm going on a tangent. You don't have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that's going to provide you with what you need during these times of trial. Yes. Although he's giving like some sarcastic uh, things here about they're, they're putting them up in uh, too high, that we're not divided, that you think we're elevated. We're really down here yeah the maze for your despise and if you want to be great in the kingdom that's what you're going to suffer yeah so, um you know his heart is in the right place here as we'll see in the next couple of verses so. yeah and then okay uh, i'd like to respond to a different subject that's in the chat room um mr rich bob uh Matthew is making the point, I don't know why, maybe earlier someone had brought this subject up, but he's, he's talking about the position of eternal sonship, the doctrine of eternal sonship. Uh, unfortunately, we, we have had uh, some people we know uh, over the last year or so uh, divide and form factions over this question of eternal sonship mm -hmm. versus incarnational sonship. Right. And uh, a couple of years ago, I started looking into this subject. I didn't know anything about it. I studied it. And I made a, a, a series of videos, maybe one hangout or two, I don't remember. It wasn't real long, a couple hours probably, uh, presenting both sides, um, incarnational sonship or eternal sonship. And uh, so if you want to know both sides of that, and, and then consider which side you think might be the correct position. I don't. I don't hold it against anybody on either side of that, because uh, both sides uh, do agree that Jesus Christ is eternal God Almighty. That Jesus Christ does not have a beginning. Uh, so it's just a question of um, before the incarnation, was he identified as the Son, or and was there a Father Son relationship, or or before the incarnation did jesus exist in a different way uh, as the word the word of god rather than the son so uh you can go look at that playlist if you want to learn both sides of that and, and look into it um all right uh let's go to the next verse uh 14 in the kjv matthias you gonna put it up I'll, I'll read 14 and 15 in the KJV, I guess. Okay. Uh, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, have ye not many fathers? For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Brother Cripps, you want to go first on those two verses? Yeah, um, this is good because um, I don't. No one likes being shamed. <laughs> I know I don't. I, I all the time. I, I joke around with people that understand that there are a lot of people out there that they live in this place of 
constantly um, trying to shame you and make you feel guilty for things that you didn't even do. Um, so I, I, I respond to that when people act in that way. But anyway, that's kind of a tangent, but you, I write these things not to shame you. So you're saying I'm not doing this, but as my beloved sons, I'm warning you for though you have 10,000 instructors. So all the different people that are out there on, on YouTube, even now instructing us in the way that they think righteousness is. And, uh, some of them, I'm um, definitely not in the true way. Um, uh, Renee mentioned the prosperity, you know, they, they set it up as part of their whole spiel. They set it up to make you think that when you, uh, begin the Christian life, then you can expect, uh, Mercedes in your driveway soon. You can expect a mansion, um, uh, on even higher levels, you know, uh, trying to tell people and using twisting scripture to make you think that, you know, prosperity is promised to you by the word, which it's not. In fact, what Paul's saying here in the in the above verses are are telling a completely different story altogether. Um, so he's saying, um, uh, even though there's so many people out there, you have not uh, no one leading you. So he used the word fathers, but he, he's he's going to make the point that there's no one uh, discipling them. Uh, for in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. So Paul's setting himself up in a place of, of being a father of sorts um, in that he's presenting them the, the, the true gospel and that he, he's calling them sons, um, which is, is to me is very personal, but I, he, I, I think he's right on. And the verse that follow will, will uh, explain this in better detail, but I'll just stop there. So this is, uh, this is him setting up uh, a scenario where he's, he's just saying, Hey, I'm, uh, through Christ, he's not saying that it isn't through Christ. He's saying through Christ, I've had many, many of you are my sons um, through the gospel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Uh, Renee, 14 and 15, but let me read these two verses in the Amplified before you, you respond. Oh, okay. okay. I do not write these things to shame you but to warn and advise you as my beloved children. For even if you were to have 10,000 teachers to guide you in Christ, yet you would not have many fathers who led you to Christ and assumed responsibility for you. For I became your father in Christ, Jesus, through the good news of, of salvation. Yeah, I want to bring people back to remembrance of 1 Corinthians 3, where he talks about no other foundation can be laid. I've laid the foundation. Uh, I've planted and Apollos watered, right? So he's, he's saying that he is set. And then there's a warning for anyone that comes behind them to defile that temple because we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. And if anyone, if any man defiles that temple, be careful how you build upon because God will destroy him. And that's somebody coming up behind him with false doctrine to build on that foundation. So um, I think it, it's clear here because again, it started out as they're divided, but Christ is not divided. It's he's one, as he said. And he's saying, I, I'm assuming that sarcasm that he wrote to them seemed a little bit hard, but he said, I write these things not to shame you. But as my beloved sons, I warn you, for though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers for in Christ, I have begotten you through the gospel. So he's reminding them that he is the no. one that brought them the message. No. Yeah. And I, I believe based on how he's saying that they should keep him as a focus, as, a, as a, an yeah. example uh, for them as they build on that foundation, to keep him as the example. Yeah. Uh, um. Um, probably about six, seven years ago, I knew a man, didn't know him real well, and I hadn't really talked a whole lot of theology with him, but he really surprised me one day uh, he, when he told me that he did not like the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul uh, is the founder of Roman Catholicism, and I said, what? How do you come up with that? And uh, this is one of the things he said, along with something else I'll tell you about. But 
uh, he's, he believes that the concept of being a spiritual father, as in Roman Catholicism, the priest is referred to as father. Okay, his name's John or Tony or James. Okay, Father James, Father Tony. I, I, I've always refused, I mean, since I became saved, I've never met a Catholic priest that I ever called father. I'll just call him by his name. It's, we're not supposed to call him and father in that way, um, according to Jesus. And yet Paul here is referring to him as their spiritual father since he led them to Christ. And this friend of mine said that's the basis for Roman Catholicism uh, to establish this priest as your spiritual father, this portion of scripture. He also blamed Paul for the um, uh, no marriage and uh, celibacy of the priest because Paul wrote, I, I would love to have you all be like me, unmarried, celibate, that way you don't have to divide your time between Jesus and and your ministry uh, your ministry with and and divide that time with your wife and children but if you are burning with lust uh, rather than fornicating you need to have a spouse to uh, have that uh, as your source for sexual needs and and your and when you do have a, a spouse and children then you are obligated to make them a priority and you cannot put as much time into ministry as, as Paul would. So Paul said it would be better. And so in those two cases, he was justifying how Paul was the reason that Roman Catholicism has these doctrines of priests being called father and the, and the Roman Catholic priests not marrying. Um, that really surprised me, but <clears throat> that's what I think of when I read this portion here. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's very, very possible. I mean, um, uh, very plausible that they they did do exactly that. Uh, but their system of fathers, as you very well know, Brother Luke, um, their system of fathers is, is not at all uh, what Paul's saying here. I mean, they, they, they're setting themselves up as you don't go through Christ, you don't go through the Holy Spirit, you have to confess through a man. So um, if it is true, which I believe it is, that they got their idea from, from Paul, they, um, the similarities stop there in the way that they set up their ridiculous system. Um, I just want to throw that in there. But, I, but I, even if they did do it, uh, the, the system that the Catholic Church set up um, is well, an what, what do you What do you think of uh, you? Uh, Brother Cripps or Renee or anybody listening now, you have actually led someone to Christ by presenting them the gospel. Mm -hmm. They came to faith and you were the vessel used to mm -hmm. give them the good news. Yep. And they even credit you with it. Say, I only, uh, how many times do I hear people say, I only believe because of Renee, Renee's channel. Yeah, right. Should we think of ourselves as their spiritual father? as Paul says here. Is that okay? Um, I I would feel reluctant to think of myself in that way just because I don't want to fall into some kind of pride. I, I'm trying to avoid that above uh, a lot of other things for sure. Um, but I feel responsibility uh, to disciple them, and, and I have. Um, of course, I feel responsibility to disciple anyone that comes into my circle, uh, whether I was responsible in some way for uh, uh, being there for them so that the Holy Spirit could reveal truth to them. But I, I would would stay away from um, considering myself that just for that reason that I mentioned. Yeah, I, I feel the same way, but because this is so different. I mean, we reach a big number of people, but I would never turn someone away. The guy, I would always try to lead them to other preachers, to right. local to local fellowships, to, you know, things that can help them grow. But, you know, my primary thing is an evangelist, not a church planter. Yeah. You know, so that's a whole different thing. I, I just preach and, and hope people get saved. But if they get saved and they want help, I go through, I get this all the time. I'm on the phone. I spend a lot of my day uh, on the phone, yeah. uh, talking to people, texting people, answering questions, do the best I can to help them. Yeah, you know, 
um, once once that happens. I, w- I wouldn't I, I wouldn't feel right just dropping the ball, but I don't think it goes to the level of Paul here because he's actually planting churches. Yeah. You know. I I think the context here is not as a uh, um, uh, church planning. Uh, it's that he he says here in the scriptures that he actually led them to Christ. Yeah. And, and that's the that's the sense that he's their father because he was the he was the instrument that got them this new birth. Yeah, I and, I agree with that. But uh, yeah, none of us. I don't think any of us would feel comfortable. I don't would not feel comfortable. I've had people refer to me this very way, right? Over right. the years, every once in a while, someone says something like that, and uh, I'm quick to correct them. But um, Paul, uh, that's how he how he saw his yeah. his relationship, the people he uh, led to Christ, that he was their father, as in this sense. I think there were so many people coming up behind Paul trying to discredit him or take his base and move them on to legalism too that he felt a need to protect them from that mm-hmm. yeah yeah okay uh shall we let's go to the next verse in the kjv uh verse 16 wherefore i beseech you be ye followers of me. Okay, Renee, I'm going to stop there. Um, that's okay. enough, enough in that one verse that we'll just, what do you yeah. say? All right. Where, what? Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that. There's not much to say about that except that he's saying, since I am your spiritual father, although you're saying, hey, I'm of this and I'm of that, and uh, but you keep me the example for your growth. I, I think that's what he's saying. And the fact that he's mentioning all the suffering they go through as apostles, um, and then he gives instruction of the opposite, how the world would respond, uh, I think he's just saying to, to follow his All right, Brother Cripps in the Amplified, we'll look at it there. Verse 16 in the Amplified says, So I urge you, be imitators of me just as a child imitates his father. Yeah. Um, I know I know for a fact because I've had discussions with the uh, hyper dispensationalists, and, and this is one of the verses that they uh, take to... Um, try to assert that um, we we can't get saved any other way. We can't get saved from by listening to the Gospels. Uh, we can't get saved by the words of Jesus. Uh, we can only get saved by the words of Paul. And they use this verse uh, to kind of prop that up. Um, yes, uh, Paul Paul is, is uh, tasked uh, to, to bring the Gospel to the Gentiles um, more specifically. Uh, absolutely, um, but it's not the only way a person can be saved. So um, you have to be really careful, I think, how you interpret this. And uh, the way the Amplified does it, it, it kind of waters it down a little bit. Uh, imitators, and that's probably even more accurate of what Paul means here. Be imitators of me. Follow the gospel that I've laid out, the one that Jesus revealed to me. Um But uh, this is where it gets dangerous when it comes to pride, I believe. But he's just saying imitates, just just as a child imitates his father. It's imitation, a little bit more watered down than the idea, to me at least, to me, uh, the idea of following as as it uh, describes it in the um, King James. Brother Luke, I just wanted to to add, when he's saying there to... To, to follow him, it's more like he, he just finished saying how he is the lowest. So he is the servant mm. for people. I like how Paula put it up. You get beneath people to lift them up. So Paul is also confirming his low state, uh, the humility uh, as, their, as their spiritual father to follow 
I, I believe it's because a lot of people are thinking, oh, oh, we only have one father and he's in heaven. Well, yes, of course. But he's saying he's begotten them through the gospel and that they should follow his walk and relationship with Christ, that he should be their their example to their walk in Christ. I just, I just wanted to clear that up because some people are, you know, saying that mm -hmm. whole father thing. Yeah. Um, well, Crips, you you beat me to the punch uh, with the hyper dispensationalist uh, issue. Oh, my apologies. And, uh, <laughs> anybody who's followed my channel very long, you are very much aware that I am uh, the champion in the cause of refuting hyper dispensationalists. Um, I. That's the common term for them. Uh, even an even further extreme version of it is ultra dispensationalism. But uh, whether it's hyper or ultra, uh, I call them Paulonius. Right. Uh, I, so I, if people start telling you that uh, basically just only listen to Paul's writings, and some say even oh, Paul's prison epistles. That's when right. the truth began. Right. Uh, but uh, if you start getting uh, people telling you this, that no, Paul's our apostle, and that uh, you can't get saved by the gospel of John, or you, you can't even get saved by the red letters, or the words that Jesus came out of Jesus' mouth, that only through Paul. And uh, if you start hearing that, run, to my playlist, Paul Onlyism debunked every single doctrine of Paul Onlyism I address and refute. So you, it's very comprehensive, and uh, there is they have no answers. If any Paul Onlyist uh, wants to go to my playlist and go through it and show me where I'm wrong, I, I welcome it. But they always cower away because they can't face the truth that they've been brainwashed with all these charts. Yeah. Um, but this, you're right, Brother Cripps, this is a verse that they love to use uh, to, to be, be followers of me, Paul says. Yeah. Um, now, whether it's followers of me or imitating me, Rene makes an excellent point if we look at the context of this chapter, uh, because he's talking about, he does refer to, uh, he's their father because he's the one that shared this gospel with them. But before that, he also talked about how he, they were living compared to how the church in Corinth was living. The focus, the focal point for, for Paul and the apostles and uh, was um, uh, service and, and even poverty. Uh, they were not trying to get rich and philosophical as the church in Corinth was. Uh, so uh, and they, it could be, it could very well mean, follow me, Paul, in this way of life in this in this humility, uh, but it, it could also mean follow me and, and um, imitate me in the gospel I presented to you. So in that way, I'll say, um, yeah, yeah, I think Paul is saying, believe my gospel, but where they go wrong is that when we say believe Paul's gospel, rather than another gospel we're not talking about uh, believe paul instead of jesus we're not talking about believe paul instead of the book of john we're not talking about believe paul instead of the apostle peter we're talking about believe paul's gospel instead of the judaizers the false teachers that are following Paul's churches around and, and trying to ruin his churches, saying Paul's a false teacher. It's not faith alone in Christ alone. It's become a Jew, practice Judaism, and then you can believe in Jesus. So uh, when is Paul saying follow him and in his gospel, he's not contrasting against Jesus or Peter or John. He's contrasting his gospel with the false gospel message of faith plus Judaism. All right, any more from you on that, guys? No, I, I, it's clear there were people coming right up behind him, sweeping right behind him every time he started a church. Yeah. Pretty confusing. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Let, let's go to verse 17 in the KJV. And it says, uh, For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son. 
and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church? Uh, Brother Cripps, so uh, that's a lot. That's an interesting verse. What do you say? Yeah, he's he's laying laying it out there just like he always does. He uses several verses to get his point across. So he's calling Timothy his son. So based on the uh, scriptures above, he's just simply saying that he brought Timothy uh, to have a relationship with Jesus. He he led him to that uh, that point. Um, and that must feel special for for Timothy as too. I mean, he he I'm I'm sure putting myself in his shoes. I'm sure that was an endearing thing. He didn't uh, he didn't balk at it. He probably probably didn't make him feel uncomfortable because he understands the way that Paul means this. Um, and he's also being trusted as as uh, being brought in by Paul. He's being trusted uh, to to send him to these to these churches and. Um, bring into remembrance the way which be in Christ. And it's the same way, this is beautiful, it's the same way that the, he says he teaches it everywhere in every church. How refreshing would it be to hear the same message over and over and over again by the same group of people and, and not ever have it deviate from that? Just pounding the same message over and over and over and over again. Um, no false doctrine, no deviation from from the, from, you know, no putting in other gospels or, um, you know, showing huge charts that try to make you understand it more like, oh, well, you're looking at the wrong way. No, the same message over and over and over again. Um, yeah, I think it's a term of endearment. And I think he's just um, he's just bringing the point home that he's made on the on the other verses about what he means by saying uh, father. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and uh, we know that there's a book, First uh, and Second Timothy, that Paul wrote uh, to this Tim Timotheus, who's also called Timothy, and uh, Timothy, and uh, uh, what's the other one? Uh, is it Philemon? That's a, that's a pastor called pastoral epistle. Mm -hmm. uh, Titus. But, uh, Titus. Yeah, Titus. Yeah, Titus and Timothy are the, they're the pastoral epistles, and Paul's writing, to telling, teaching them how to be a pastor. And um, uh, so, verse seventeen in the Amplified. Let's look at that, and then Renee, you can respond. And so, okay, it says, for for this reason, I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. And he will remind you of my way of life in Christ, that is, my conduct and my precepts for godly living, just as I teach everywhere in every church. Right? Yeah, I, I wanted to say something that Jason said. I'm so glad he brought up, wouldn't it be great to have the same message? I was listening this afternoon on the way back from church, and they can't even agree what faith means. Oh my gosh. It's so They're adding works of faithfulness and obedience and a changed life and repentance from sin. All this is crammed into the word faith. And yeah. if you don't have it, it's spurious faith. It's intellectual assent. So they're really saying you're saved or prove you're saved by how good you live. And so uh, they can't agree on what believe or faith means because they've crammed works into those words. Yeah. And that's why people are confused and yeah. it's ridiculous. So when he says here, for this cause have I sent uh, sent you sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord. He shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ. So again, it's about how he is walking in Christ as an example. Yep. Paul's way of walking in Christ. He's not saying I am the Father, nope. like the Pope says. He has begotten them through the gospel, and Timotheus has also been begotten through the gospel, but he has discipled Timothy. He has shown him his ways of walking in the Lord. So if they watch Timothy, they're going to see how Paul walks because Timothy walks as Paul walks in Christ. And uh, I like it says that he teaches everywhere in every church. I, I love that yeah. you're never going to see contradiction in what Paul says. It's always the foundation of Jesus. 
and then he reminds you who you are who god says you already are in his son and therefore if you steal steal no more walk in newness of life leave fornication present your bodies a living sacrifice because you are the brethren you yes. are saved yes and you'll see that in in every letter it is consistent wouldn't it be great uh renee to go visit friends in another state and another city and and be invited to go to church and for you to be like yeah of course because you know it's the same gospel amen amen you, you go anywhere in the country can't find as a matter of fact almost all of them have the roman catholic reformation type thing they say they're reformed but it's the same thing if you take away the idols and the yep. and all that it's yep. the same thing it's work salvation yep. but because they know the bible preaches against that they cram their works in the very words of faith and belief to begin with. Yeah, it's, it's faith it, alone, but faith is actually works. It's it, it's faith alone, but it works. It's free, but it costs you everything. Right. It's faith alone, but faith is actually works. Yep. So it's just a bunch of confusion. Yeah, I would like that. I would. Very sad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so we should not think that when he says that uh, for this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus who is my beloved son uh, you know some person could pull that out of context and say see Paul's a fornicator and adulterer he had relations with with Timothy's mother yeah. and he has this son and he's not married obviously but the, the context of course says he's talking about being a father in a spiritual sense yeah. because he led Timothy to the Lord yeah. and so uh, you know you can see how something could easily be twisted if someone's evil a, a verse taken out of context is a pretext mm -hmm. and, and that's unfortunately that's done every day thousands of times um, uh, in the Amplified though um, it seems to agree with Renee's position on this, that uh, he says, Paul says, um, be a follower of me or imitate me. He's talking about uh, this uh, way of living. He says, um, and he will remind you of my way of life in Christ, that is my conduct and my precepts for godly living, just as I teach everywhere in every church. So they are zeroing in on that, as Rene did, rather than zeroing on that follow Paul as uh, the, the gospel. Yes. If someone wants to say follow Paul be, because he's he has the right gospel and Jesus and John and Peter didn't, uh, then that's what I was addressing because they misuse that verse. Mm -hmm. uh, let's look at the footnotes here in the NABRE on these verses here. It says, uh, verses uh, 14 to 17 in the footnotes okay it says my beloved children that is the the close of the argument is dominated by the tender metaphor of the father who had not only who not only gives his children life but also educates them wow that's pretty profound yeah. Once he has begotten them through his preaching, Paul continues to present the gospel to them existentially mm. by his life as, as uh, well as by his word. And they are to learn, as children do, by imitating their parents. Mm. The reference to the rod in 1 Corinthians 4.21 belongs... Oh, that's... Uh, jumping ahead let me I won't read that yet okay so that's uh that's a pretty good um, footnote there don't you think I do and this is the example this is the way that, this is the way that we should be so if if we're um, if we're bringing some if someone claims about us that that we brought them to Christ which is wonderful it's a wonderful accolade to to have someone say um and then of course you give all glory to the holy spirit because you didn't actually save anyone it's christ that saves and and uh, you're not responsible for that at all but if you do that then you are to disciple that person or as renee said you know if if you don't have the time for each individual you have 
you have all these people that are that are demanding your attention, then you direct them uh, to someone else that that would be able to disciple them. But either way, you're 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 uh, leading them in that direction. But the biggest way to do it is by imitation, by uh, allowing your life, the way that you act, the way that you treat other people, the way that you talk, to be a representation of the same gospel that you that that you've preached. Um, you want them to to preach the same gospel when when they're in that position where they've been discipled enough and they're ready, and God puts people into their path. You want them to regurgitate the same gospel which uh, which you're preaching to them, which is the same gospel that Paul's preaching. Um, you want to just keep doing that over and over and over again, and that's the way it should look. It should be each person is discipling another person and they're going with the same gospel and they're discipling someone else. Um, and then you're, you're not being infiltrated by all these false doctrines that they won't be able to be swayed. Once you understand these concepts, nobody can uh, put, put a false gospel on you and, and you go, oh yeah, well that makes sense or a false doctrine. Mm -hmm. I like how it mentioned that he is reminding them that yeah. Yeah. Coming back and bringing them back to the gospel. I yeah. that that's necessary. Yep. Okay. Okay, we'll go back to the KJV for verse uh, 18. Now, some are puffed up as though I would not come to you. I'm going to read verse 19 also. But I will come to you shortly if the Lord will, and will know not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. Mm. Renee, 18 and 19. Yeah, um, so when it says, now some are puffed up as though I wouldn't come to you, but I will come to you shortly if the Lord will, and will know not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. Again, this goes back to them which think they have arrived and they got it all. Uh, and uh, he's reminded, he says, you, you've gotten to this. It sounds like a place of arrogance or it's, in some places it's even apathy. Remember, he says, but ye are puffed up rather and have not mourned when that sin was going on. Yeah. So, the puffed up can not only mean arrogance, uh, it can also mean apathy and uh, I don't want to say laziness, but uh, they just they're not doing anything about it. Like they're, they're already they're fine with it. Like everything's just kind of the word is leaving me at the moment. But the same thing happened when the guy was sick with his stepmom. He said, but she are puffed up and, and have not worn rather. So. Um, He's saying that they've gotten to the place as if he's not going to show up, that he's not going to be there with correction. Mm. Um, and and he is their spiritual father, and he needs to correct these issues because it's already starting with division, as the, the beginning of the chapter mentions. You know, mm. in the chapter before, that they're divided over uh, who is under what, who got baptized by whom, dividing Christ. Um, but he also says, but not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. Uh, and I find it interesting because Brother Luke mentioned that he's one of the most educated. He was a Pharisee, a son of the Pharisee, under the greatest teacher at the time, Gamaliel. And he had uh, extreme knowledge of the scriptures. But once Christ taught him, he saw those scriptures come to life. And that's why I love Paul's letters, because he brings all the Old Testament into living color. Yeah. You know? um, so here i i think it uh all of this is just a correction for them to follow him and not be divided and also to understand if you want to be great you need to be the least because being high up in the kingdom of god is actually being a servant as, as christ was a servant mm -hmm. uh, so I, I just think he's saying he's going to show up himself and and deal with these issues mm -hmm. Because he wants them prepared. He wants them walking in righteousness. He wants them to be a good example, but he wants them to remain on the true foundation and in unity. Mm -hmm. Now, be before I read uh, the Amplified for you, Brother Cripps, I want to just say that um, you, some of you may remember the video I made a few weeks ago. I don't know what the title was something like, How to Fight 
the lordship heretics. Uh, the, what's the proper way to deal with them, I think? And I, and I was saying that we need to do some jujitsu on them instead of instead of uh, letting them pummel us with all their problem verses and what about this word, what about that verse, and always be on the defensive. We need to turn it on now. And uh, so I hope you'll watch that video. But one of the things uh, I made uh, in the point in that video and my video also is titled, Show Me Your Resume. Show me your resume. I love that. All you, uh, yeah, all you who are arguing that faith alone in Christ alone is not enough, that you've got to have religious works accompanying it, then I would say, show me your resume of religious works that you do every day. I, I need to see. It must be very impressive that you can go point the finger at everybody and accuse everybody. And, and so you must have a lot of great works to, on your resume. Yep. And when you ask them to present the resume of good works to you, you'll find out they don't really have any or very little at all. It's puny. Yep. And so I think Paul is saying that here to these people. And, and as I see it in the Amplified, it says, verse 18 and 19 in the Amplified. Now, now some of you have become arrogant and pretentious as though I were not coming to see you. Mm. I will come to you soon if the Lord is willing and I will find out not just the talk of these arrogant people but evaluate their spiritual power whether they live up to their own claims sound familiar i don't think i've ever clapped on this broadcast but that that the amplified puts exactly the way i was seeing it when renee was talking she used the word puffed up and was was kind of alluding to the arrogance of that that's exactly what i see absolute and total arrogance that Paul's uh, talking about here and the way he's going to deal with it isn't just by talk. This is great. Not just by the talk, their talk, the arrogant people, not just by hearing what they say. Oh, Paul's not going to come to us. <laughs> They're not. Well, yeah, he's not coming. Yeah, he's coming. He's coming shortly if the Lord wills. And then when he does come, he, he'll he he'll solve the matter um, by seeing if they're, they're, the Amplified uh, puts a spiritual in brackets uh, and that's clear from, from the King James Version, but he, this, this puts it into more perspective, to see if their uh, walk matches their talk, bottom line, to see if they're doing everything that their talk would uh, signify. And uh, he's going to straighten them out. <laughs> if I were one of these puffed up, arrogant people, then I might be, be shaking in my boots. Um, but the thing is, an arrogant and pretentious uh, person um, maybe isn't able to to have godly fear in that way, uh, and and to be able to know that what the way that they're acting is uh, not consistent with the words that are coming out of their mouth. So, um, yeah, that's good stuff. I uh, this this really is a big deal to me, and I've made a number of videos about it, especially recently, but. I think we are missing the boat and we are letting them off the hook when we let them go on and on arguing against our gospel and and saying that, oh no, you've got to have a changed life without turning it around on them. We're letting them off the hook if we do not turn it around on them and ask them, okay, if that was true, and you must be really living a great life. So let me evaluate it. Because Paul here in the Amplified, if they get it, got it right, says uh, to see if, whether they live up to their own claims. Come on, you're claiming that religious works are required to they prove you're really saved. They never meet well, standards they put on others. Yeah, they never meet. But we don't. We're we're not. We're not putting them on the on the uh, um, on the spot. You know, see what what is their problem? It's pride. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you how do you address pride? Humiliation. Matthias, you don't need to respond. 
but I'm, I'm thinking of you now too. You're so kind and you're so patient and you let them go on and on and on and on. I think you and all of us, when we deal with these people, you more so than, than anybody are as patient and will deal with people, the, the lordship heretics. I think we have to humiliate them. Their problem is spiritual pride. We need to humiliate them. They'll admit it, but they'll go, I'll go, so, oh, so you don't sin at all anymore. You just complete, well, no, I mean, I still make mistakes. Okay, well, then why are you telling everybody else that they've got to completely be sinless? Well, I'm not saying that. I'm just, yes, you are. It's either perfection or not. And you do, they do. When you put them in a corner, that's where they are. And, and I'm, the law needs to shut their mouth. They need to become guilty so that they yes. can. Yes. Yes. They've never become guilty. That's part of the problem. Right? They made them guilty. They don't have the real standards of the law. Like right. Brother Luke says, easy legalism. Yeah. <laughs> easy legalism. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, let's go to uh, back to the KJV for verse 20 uh, and 21. I'll read them both. Okay. For the kingdom of God is not in word but in power what will ye shall I come unto you with a rod or in love and in the spirit of meekness brother Cripps yeah so um, he's just saying that the the kingdom of God is not just in word just look at all the power that comes from it um, uh, yeah there's a lot of words uh, the all the words of the Old Testament uh, leading up to this point there there are plenty of words there's all kinds of words 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 everywhere um, but that's that's just what goes on the papyrus so to speak um, the power is the power is in all the things that uh, God has done all all his uh, works his plan for salvation his delivery, his redemption, all of that is in power, not just words. Um, shall I come to you the rod or in love, the spirit of meekness? Um, yeah, he's just saying, uh, would you rather I come, you know, beating you over top of the head or would you rather I come with, with love and compassion and uh, from a place of meekness? Um, just as the, you know, there was reference in the notes to the Beatitudes, you know, and one of, one of Jesus' things in that is the meek shall inherit the earth. And so it's that same meekness that we want to have. It's the same meekness that Jesus wanted wanted his disciples to um, show in other people. Um, uh, funnily enough, except to the Pharisees. <laughs> Pharisees were the only people that, that Jesus didn't always act uh, uh, meek towards. He, he uh, rattled their cages, so to speak, and he did it with sarcasm. Um, but yeah, Paul's saying with you guys, w which would you prefer? And I, for one, uh, would prefer the, the spirit of meekness. And I prefer to act in that way too towards others. Yeah. Um, most of us understand that the characters in the Bible known as the Pharisees, particularly the Pharisees that Jesus had to d deal with personally, uh, that their character, their character uh, was uh, just like this. Arrogance, puffed up, spiritual pride, self-righteousness, condemning others. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. Does that sound like the hardship heretics we're dealing with every day? Yep. Now, I remember Jesus dealing with uh, a prostitute and an adulterer and a tax collector with yeah. nothing but love and kindness and no harsh words. But I, the only harsh words was with Jesus dealing with these self-righteous religious hi hypocrites, the Pharisees. Yep. There's something about spiritual pride and self-righteousness that really got him upset. Yes. And I think that we should have the same spirit as Jesus uh, about this problem and we should have a righteous indignation against those who are full of self-righteousness. Yep. Well, we got to be careful to not attack people that might really be on the fence trying to figure it out and really do say, hey, what about this verse? I don't understand it. 
There's a difference in that, but besides people coming at you, calling you greasy, grace, easy believers, and and hating the guy, there's a, a difference with that. But Paul, like you said, he didn't put up with it. No, not for an hour. He didn't give them space. He didn't, if they came against the gospel or came preaching something else, he didn't give them time at all. Mark and avoid. And if, you know, they, they won't believe it, you can't make them believe it. And I, and I agree with you, Brother Luke, on that end. Because it's they are enemies of the cross. Just because they say the name Jesus doesn't mean they're our brethren. No. If they, if they have another gospel, I don't know what they used to believe, but right now they're against it, and they're an enemy of the cross. And and I don't I don't you know I I think I may have even been too patient. It's just that I've seen people actually come around to the truth, and I and I can't always tell which ones are over enemies right away. And right. which ones are on the fence and really right. have questions because they've been taught this their whole lives. Yeah. You know? So of course this sounds foreign to them. Yeah. So but they they really um a lot of them, if you notice, like Brother Luke said, Jesus, he called them your father is the devil. He flat out said, You are of your father the devil. Yeah. The murderer and his works you will do. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, he he didn't say that, like Brother Luke said, about any overt sinner. He was yeah. kind to the woman caught in the dark. He was kind to the yeah. one that had five husbands. Yeah. And he was the one that wasn't. He was kind to the tax collectors. He, he didn't uh, ever say, your father's the devil. He right. saw them as sick people needing a physician. Yes. But, but these uh, spiritually prideful people, he really laid into them. Yep. He didn't put even John the Baptist did too, Brother Luke. Who told you to escape the coming wrath? <laughs> he didn't put up with it either. He knew yeah. their hearts. Yeah, yeah. John the Baptist, Jesus, Paul. Uh, they're they're being getting really tough with these people who are puffed up. Uh, look, look at twenty and twenty one in the Amplified. Uh, the, the Amplified twenty and twenty one says. For the kingdom of God is not based on talk, but on power. Which do you prefer? Shall I come to you with a rod of discipline and correction, or with love and a gentle spirit? Mm. Uh, but we, let's not lose sight of this. And, and remember, I'm backing up. He says, uh, uh, Verse 18 in the Amplified says, Now some of you have become arrogant and pretentious as though I were not coming to see you. In other words, he's threatening them. He says, oh, yeah, you're really getting really cocky. You know, like, like you're not worried about me coming there, but I am going to come there. And you're going to, when I come there, do you need me to get really, really harsh with you? <laughs> really crack the whip on, on you and, and put you in your place? Uh, or... Wouldn't it be better if we could do it with gentleness? Yeah. Let's read the notes in the NABRE on these last three verses. Don't make me come over there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, the notes uh, for 18 through 21 says, um, 420 picks up the contrast between a certain kind of talk, or that's logos, okay. and the true power dynamis from the first corinthians 1 17 and 18 and first corinthians 2 4 and 5 the kingdom which many of them imagine to be fully present in their lives first corinthians 4 8 will be rather unexpectedly disclosed in the strength of paul's encounter with them if they make a powerful intervention on his part necessary compare the similar ending to an argument in 2 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 4, and verse 10. Yeah. Don't make me come over there. That's what he's saying. Hey, Brother Luke, I'm yeah. going to actually use 1 Corinthians chapter by chapter and go, oh, so Christians don't sin. Christians are the real. It, it proves you're not saved. Let's go. Let's look at each chapter. You will see something he's correcting in behavior in every single chapter yes. from prostitution to division from suing each other yeah. to false doctrine to having sex with relatives yeah. to you name it it's being done in this church 
and he had called them all brethren and not once did he threaten their salvation no nope. he threatens correction their behavior every time yep all right uh, let's let's uh, respond to the, the chat room a little bit here I, I noticed that uh, sister Paula she seems uh maybe surprised she says the amplified seems to be a modern version acceptable to KJV quote enthusiasts unquote smiley face uh, well Paula uh, the amplified is uh, what I've introduced to the study, uh, I've been using it, contrasting it to the KJV and and helping me to understand the KJV. Uh, I'm happy to have you and any others bring the Greek and, and any and commentaries or anything else and footnotes, anything that will help me to understand. I'm I'm eager to look at it, but the I. I I don't think you should assume that everybody is is as excited about the amplified as I am. I do find about uh, maybe one verse out of a thousand. I don't know if we've done a thousand verses, but but very 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 small percentage of it. There's a verse in the amplified that uses the term "repent of your sins" uh, and, and and interprets it that way. Uh, the way that we all object to the modern translations uh, when we don't think it, it repenteth means to stop sinning. So every once in a while we catch the Amplified with uh, what I think is a mistake. But 99.9% .9 of the time the Amplified actually seems to be helpful to me. But it's not, it, it's something that I'm kind of, uh, I'm introducing. Uh, everybody's accepting. I don't see anybody leaving and angry because I'm using it. But uh, we still all agree, at least Cripps, Renee and I, and pretty much everybody else uh, on the Sunday and program, we, we rely on the KJV as our first source and we test all others against it. Um, but we're, we're, we're willing to look at the Amplified and something else if, it, if sometimes it helps. Uh, now, before we finish up, if you have a, co a question in the chat room or um, a comment that you want to make and you want a response from us, then put it in all caps now and we'll, we'll answer that before we finish up. Um, but okay, we'll, we'll leave the study at the end of this chapter, uh, four is completed. Uh, so Renee, why don't you tell me your thoughts on, on uh, the, these verses that we discussed tonight. Yeah, tonight it seemed more like uh, Paul is uh, trying to lead them on their walk. And uh, like he's addressing their division earlier, now he, he's also addressing uh, the how they should follow him on his walk. And also how the kingdom of God is different than the kingdom of the world. And that you, you won't necessarily see things manifested here in this world as a, according to the world sees success. But that no matter what, uh, uh, if you want to lead, you, you've got to get beneath people. You have to be a servant. Um, and, and as always, the correction is, is also not to be, not to ever think yourself above or as arrived or beyond teaching or correction. But the last part we looked at it, it, it seems to me that he's reminding them um, to follow his actual walk with Christ as an example. And although they're giving other people credit for discipling them or whatever, that if, if anything is not matching what Paul would have done in his walk, that they should keep him, their eye on him as the example for that. Amen. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay. Um, uh, Brother Dave asks, why, why do so many people claim faith equals obedience? Uh, well, um, I think that um, those people are stuck in this uh, heretical doctrine of faith plus works. Mm -hmm. And when they're confronted with verses that disprove it, 
they have to redefine words, just like a Calvinist has to redefine words, because the words of the Bible contradict Calvinism. The words of the Bible contradict faith plus works for salvation. So they have to redefine the words. Yeah. I even made a video titled Believe Defined. Do, 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 you, do you think, I never dreamed that I'd ever have to come on YouTube and define the word believe. Yep, but you do. Yeah. It comes from the false teachers, Luke. It's coming from John MacArthur and Paul Washer and these TV preachers saying that faith is actually faithfulness and obedience. They're redefining it to add works. And it's coming from this because the majority of preachers will not tell you that faith is to trust or to take God at his word, to believe his promises. But faith is, is about your performance your lifestyle and this is the majority of the teachers that's where it's coming from these are all the best-selling books the john MacArthur, the mormons even use john MacArthur's books all the ray comfort all these people with big ministries that's what they're preaching yeah. it's either that or the prosperity gospel that's all that's out there you won't see a big ministry that preaches the true gospel no nope. it's very rare uh, uh, Joseph Prince does, but he puts the word of faith stuff in there, the prosperity stuff. So it's not completely pure. Yeah. And then, and, and, why. And that's then, why. And then charges, if you want to hear the whole sermon, it's ridiculous. Right. So right. that's where they're getting it from. That's why so many are uh, mixing up faith with obedience. Yeah. Because that's what these people are claiming faith is instead of it being the substance the things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen to take God at his word to believe his promises to, to trust in they, they're redefining it and these this is where everybody's getting it from I guarantee it all the big books John MacArthur single-handedly has destroyed the gospel I think I, I he has a, a, a big and Billy Graham same thing Billy Graham has come out he had that he started this mess back in the 70s and 80s I think it's the big teachers. Well, okay. We've talked about that, what the problem is. Uh, they, they, they have this doctrine. And to defend the doctrine, they're forced to redefine words. But let's go back farther into their mind and ask, what is the root of the problem? Why would they, that kind of a doctrine attract people? It attracts a lot of people. The, 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 all the religions of the world are all based on this one thing, and that is that I will present my righteousness to God. And so why do they want to do that instead of just allow uh, for the righteousness of Christ to be credited to them and rely on that? And it's because of glory. Uh, they, they want glory for themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm not real happy about a lot of things in the reformate came out of the Reformation, but there's a um, idea it's called the five solas, S O L A S. It means the five onlys, uh, uh, and sola uh, gloria is one of these five. Only glory for God. God must get all the glory. Uh, but man, well, that's what happened. Uh, the, Satan wanted glory, he rebelled. Adam and Eve, they wanted glory, they, they rebelled. And we all have this desire for glory for ourselves. Instead of, the Bible says, all glory is reserved for God. Yeah. You try to t take any glory for yourself, then, then you're doomed. You have to humble yourself and say, I have, there's no glory. It's all for Jesus. And uh, so you cannot have um, uh, sola, sola, sola fide means faith only. Uh, that means faith, no works. But if you add works, you can't, it nullifies sola gloria. So with, if you don't have um, uh, faith only, then you don't have all the glory for God. If you don't have faith in Christ only, sola Christo, then that means that you get some of the glory. It's not all, it's not sola gloria, all the glory to God. Uh, 
God forbid. What's the other one? Um, uh, brother, like Sola Scriptura. Grace, yeah, Sola Gracia uh, means, means that if it's if it's in anything besides God being gracious, that means that you have some personal merit that makes you deserving. Then that means that you don't have Sola Gloria anymore. So you have to have Sola Christes, Sola Fide, Sola Gloria, and those things are necessary for you to have Sola uh, Gloria. All the glory can only go to God and stay with God if it's faith alone and Christ alone. Brother alone. Luke, this is how they're getting around that. I heard this just tonight by Dr. James White. They claim sola fide, but the entire sermon on sola fide crammed so many works in that fide. It, it crammed obedience, faithfulness, perseverance of the saints, everything into the faith. So it's faith alone, but that faith is a lot of works. And he says the way he keeps it into God's glory is that he gives God credit for all the works he's doing. But again, it's not based on our works, whether God or us is doing it. It's based on a very specific work, the work on Calvary. And so this is how they're doing it, Brother Luke. It's so subtle that they are redefining it, giving God all the credit, and then redefining what faith means. It's, it's very subtle. It's a subtlety that Beguile leaves. So technically, if you look at scripture, they're not saying anything unscriptural. They're just redefining what that what those words actually mean so that they can say it's faith alone and yeah. all God's glory. But in reality, they're preaching works. Yeah. It's very frustrating to hear it. Yep. And that's why people will come to me and swear that MacArthur and Piper and Washer, oh no, they preach grace through faith. They preach it. They don't they don't preach works because they are so blind to the works being crammed into the words faith and believe and grace and everything else. You can hear it once you see it, Renee. Once you see it, you can hear it. It's subtle. It's free, but it'll cost you everything. Yep. Uh, God just, you know, it's free, but it'll cost all of you. You got to give, submit all of yourself to the Lordship of Christ. Anything they can do to make it about what you're doing yep. without changing the word. You have to be holy, Renee. You have it, it, to be it, holy like he's holy. Yeah, I, I, their own personal holiness is a joke. Yep. They can't. Hey, uh, that. hey uh, Brother Cripps, uh, you know how sometimes, maybe even often, I skip you accidentally, right? Yeah. Yeah. So do, do you want to have some glory for yourself now? I no. You don't? You I don't? Because I, I, I didn't forget you. I, when I, I let Renee give her summary yeah. of her thoughts tonight, I didn't ask you if you want to summarize your thoughts yet. Oh, no, I know. I, I realize that. But you went into um, talking in the chat and answering a couple of things and, and it, we kind of went off in a, in a different way. Yeah, I know. But yep. I didn't forget you in the back of my mind. I've, I've remembered that I didn't ask you that. I've been waiting. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'd be waiting a long time because I, I, I so would. It's time, uh, it's, time, it's time now for you to take uh, <laughs> center stage and <laughs> you need to tell us your summary thoughts. Uh, my uh, thank you, brother Luke. My my summary thoughts are 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 pretty simple. Um, I I like what Paul Paul saying here about the father stuff, and I love the discussion, and I and I believe that um, we've uh, amplified it very very well, so that uh, no one no one can misinterpret what Paul's saying. Um, and uh, you know the the example that he gives is the same example that we should that we should be giving. If we uh, bring someone along, we should disciple them uh, and preach the same gospel that that we've been uh, that, that we've accepted, um, the same one that we're talking about here. Um, and the last thing is that I I just feel sad, you know. And hearing Renee talk about all all these um, false teachers are out there and they have these huge followings, and the idea this this uh, this idea. That was it, it, uh, that Paul presented at the beginning was be of one mind. He wanted that desperately, and and he fought tooth and nail to try to keep that. Don't listen to these false teachers that are coming back and trying to divert you from the gospel that I already preached to you. And sure enough, he did it. And you've heard me say this before: 
He did that because he knew, God knew that it would be a problem in our time as well. And it is, it's pervasive. All these, all these big, big time preachers out there that seem to get the most uh, TV time, they seem to get the biggest following and they're preaching a high percentage of truth. But again, if you have a glass of water and it's pure water and it, you put 1% poison in there, it's still gonna kill you. It is still gonna kill you. So um, yeah, what I walk away with tonight is um, that I'm longing for Christ's return. I'm longing for um, all of the, the body of Christ being of one mind at last and not having to, to deal with all this false stuff that is robbing, uh, killing and stealing uh, from people. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, all right, if there's nothing else from the chat room we need to respond to, then uh, I guess the uh, last thing I'll say is um, this is Wednesday, so the next one will be Friday, the Fellowship Friday program. Uh, that, uh, that will begin 9.30 Eastern time. We have a lot of fun on that program. And uh, Matthias tells me that uh, his wife, uh, another sister, Paula, uh, wants to join the Friday uh, program. So I think we'll have, uh, let me see, um, Cripps, Brother, Brother Dave, Daniel, Renee, Lisa, Paula Bible Literalist, and Sister Paula. So we should have quite a, a good uh, kind of large fun uh, panel. And so everybody join us Friday at 930 Eastern time. And I guess that's it, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. Bless you all in the name of our great savior, God, Jesus. <laughs>